compromise because other states uh, like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, at this point we're moving uh, toward uh, abolition, um, did not have enslaved people uh, by this point. Because Massachusetts had abolished slavery by this point. Uh, and they didn't think it was right for enslaved people to count for the purposes of representation because they were not uh, citizens and they were really barred from the political process. So they came up with this three-fifths compromise saying that uh, for every five enslaved people, um, they would, a state would get three, uh, would get th uh, three persons counted uh, in the enumeration for determining representation in, uh, in Congress, in the House of Representatives. And so this uh, in and of itself is oftentimes pointed to as, as, as the way in which the, the Constitution regarded people of African descent as something less than whole persons, certainly enslaved people, certainly as less uh, than, than whole persons. They also had to deal with the question of uh, fugitive slaves. What if someone like James Somerset or someone like Quoth Walker um, fled to another state? So, you know, Somerset and Walker were people who had fled from their owners and sued for their freedom. What if somebody from Virginia fled to Massachusetts? Um, were they still uh, slaves? And in, in the Constitution, uh, the, the framers um, uh, clearly stated that if you are held to service and labor of one state, um, you are not granted freedom, I'm starting to paraphrase here, you're not granted freedom by fleeing to another state. So it really uh, established a, uh, a very clear legal definition of, uh, of slavery uh, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that particular section. But what I really wanted to talk about tonight, and it's just taken me all this time to, to build, up, uh, build up to this, was how the framers of the Constitution dealt with the question of the slave trade. And uh, this was uh, something that states were already doing. Um, uh, some states were moving toward passing what were called non-importation law, forbidding the importation of uh, a slave, uh, enslaved people into their, into their states. And a number of states had, uh, had already done this, particularly uh, in, uh, the, um, in the Northeast. And so this was, this was, again, the trend. It was that promise of, of, of revolution. But the question that the framers had to deal with was would Congress have the power to regulate the international slave trade? Would Congress have the authority to pass a, a sweeping national law forbidding the international uh, slave trade? And there were some uh, intense discussions uh, about this. Uh, interestingly, um, like his fellow Virginian uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson, uh, George Mason spoke out uh, very strongly in favor of allowing Congress to pass a non-importation law, allow, giving Congress the, the power to regulate the international uh, slave trade. Uh, like, uh, like Jefferson, uh, Mason was a, a prominent slaveholder. He owned over 200 uh, enslaved people. And, um, but he thought a lot like Jefferson. He believed that this was a problem uh, and because of his um, sort of um, a racialized ideology, he did not see um, how uh, simply abolishing slavery uh, would work very well, uh, but one way to begin the process was at least to abolish the international uh, slave trade. Uh, other very prominent and outspoken opponents referring to the slave trade as a nefarious and evil traffic uh, was Rufus King of Massachusetts. Uh, but uh, there, were, there were prominent defenders of the slave trade uh, as, uh, as well. And they didn't really defend it so much on ideological grounds. They didn't try to say that it wasn't as bad as, as, as the uh, critics said it was, that anti-slavery um, advocates said it was. But they simply said it was a matter of commercial interests. Um, Charles Pinckney of South Carolina, John Rutledge uh, of South Carolina, um, uh, basically said that if, if, if the Constitution included um, uh, a provision allowing Congress to uh, uh, regulate the international slave trade, then South Carolina would not uh, sign off on the Constitution. They would not support it. And the possibility of keeping the Union together um, with this Constitution would, would fall apart on this issue. We will not support allowing uh, that provision in, in the Constitution. So um, ultimately what the framers came up with uh, was a compromise. Uh, Roger Sherman uh, of Connecticut uh, was also uh, a critic of the international slave trade 
Uh, but Sherman argued that these state level non-importation laws are proceeding. Uh, it seems that the trend is uh, states are moving toward passing non-importation laws. Let's let the states handle this. Let's leave this to the states to decide. And so ultimately uh, what uh, the framers uh, uh, inserted in the Constitution was Article 1, Section 9, uh, which stated that Congress shall pass no laws concerning uh, the slave trade. They didn't use the term slave trade. This, concerning the importation of, of, of purpose uh, of, actually, I'll read it to you just so I have it, have it straight. It's actually kind of fun going back and reading the Constitution, uh, preparing, preparing for this. Yes, they, they wrote, the migration or importation of such persons as any uh, of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808 uh, by a tax or duty, but a tax or duty may be imposed of, by, on such importation not exceeding uh, $10 for each person. Um, so Congress had the power to levy uh, taxes um, on, on this trade, but did not have the power uh, to, uh, to prohibit it uh, until 1808. Uh, and so it was a 20 year reprieve for, for the issue. Um, so a compromise. So what I'd like to do now is to, to talk a little bit about what happened, what happened next and what happened over the next uh, 20 years uh, up to 1808 and then uh, in, in the ensuing decades uh, after, uh, after 1808. The uh, abolitionist movement uh, only continued to, to grow in strength uh, in the 18, excuse me, the 1780s. Uh, between 1787, though, and 1808, about 100,000 persons were imported uh, into the United States uh, as enslaved people. Many of them came uh, into places like Louisiana, which were added uh, to the Republic with the uh, Louisiana Purchase in 18, 1803. There was a flurry of slave trading People knew, slave traders knew, that it, Congress was likely to abolish the slave trade in 1808. So there's a flurry of, of importations leading up, uh, leading up to that year. But international attitudes on the trade continued, uh, uh, continued uh, to turn against the institution. And interestingly, uh, the, uh, the empire that had profited the most from the slave trade uh, in the 18th century uh, would have the strongest uh, abolitionist movement in terms of, of speaking specifically of Great uh, Britain. Uh, anti-slavery publications, this is one of the classic examples uh, of uh, the anti-slavery literature from this period published in, in 1786 uh, shows uh, the, um, uh, the way in which uh, people were uh, crammed into uh, the lower decks of uh, these large uh, ships. This is hard to see, I'm sure, from the back, but these are people stacked up uh, like, uh, like sardines, stacked up um, and given very little room uh, to move side to side or even stand up. Some of the most uh, uh, prominent and powerful uh, abolitionists were people who had experienced this themselves. Ola Ude Equiano um, was a, a man who had been captured as a child in what is now Nigeria. Um, he went by the name Gustavus Vasa for much of his uh, adult life. Um, from Nigeria, he had been taken to the Caribbean, later to Virginia and, and Georgia. Uh, and later, uh, he was taught to read and write by one of, uh, one of his masters, a man who was a Quaker. Uh, and he uh, uh, became a devoutly a religious, very um, a, a born again a Christian, part of the larger awakening of the, of the 18th century. And he became very active uh, after uh, uh, earning his freedom uh, in the British abolitionist movement. He settled in Britain uh, and he uh, kind of worked bes behind the scenes for a number of years, um, helping um, distribute pamphlets. Uh, but then he, he wrote his own autobiography uh, that was published in 1789 that really lays out in, very, a personal, in a very personal and, and intense way uh, the horrors of the international uh, slave trade. Great Britain, uh, British Parliament would uh, pass 
uh, a ban on the international slave trade uh, and its empire in 1807. Uh, and Congress would pass a non-importation law abolishing the international slave trade into the United States in 1808. But those attitudes of uh, you know, what role would uh, freed people play in uh, the early republic uh, that, that whites harbored um, uh, remained, even among people who were abolitionists, people who were supportive, supporters of ending the international slave trade, were not, were not necessarily in favor of extending uh, full civil rights, full human rights uh, to uh, former, uh, former slaves. The British answer uh, to, to this was to establish a colony uh, in West Africa. Uh, this was Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone uh, has been in the news a lot lately because of the uh, Ebola uh, crisis there. Uh, and, but Sierra Leone was originally created uh, back in uh, 1808, 1808 up here, but the, uh, the British government had begun settling people of African descent who, who had, were living uh, in the British Empire uh, to Sierra Leone in West Africa beginning in the 1780s. Uh, in fact, people who had fled their masters in the American Revolution and had joined the British cause and fight, fought against the American Revolution, uh, many of these people uh, were relocated to, uh, to Nova Scotia and then to London, and eventually they were settled in Sierra Leone. Um, they were not necessarily wanted in, uh, in London and, and in, in English society. Um, so uh, in terms of the international slave trade, Sierra Leone became a place where uh, people who were uh, still being uh, uh, transported across the Atlantic on slave ships uh, as, as, as slave traders really turned uh, to, to piracy to continue uh, being international slave traders. Of course, people continued to, to do this because, because it was profitable. Uh, they were trading with other, other empires. Or they, were, they were smuggling in uh, uh, people into the United States. Uh, and, um, what to do with these people who were, who were recaptured, um, who were liberated from, uh, from these slave traders. And so Sierra Leone was a place where the British uh, Navy uh, could resettle these, these individuals uh, and uh, start a new life. An American by the name of Paul uh, Cuffey, uh, Cuffey was uh, of Native American and African descent, um, one of the uh, most wealthy uh, ship, uh, 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 shipping magnates, if you will, uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, he, he had a whaling business uh, and he had um, a business, a, sh a shipping business from New England to the Caribbean um, and uh, pro uh, was a prominent supporter of uh, free Africa societies, uh, Africa fraternal societies uh, for free blacks in, uh, in New England. Uh, Covey became very interested in this idea of Sierra Leone, and he visited Sierra Leone, uh, he traveled there, uh, and he, he saw the idea of, of establishing uh, these, uh, these uh, semi-autonomous states in West Africa as, as, as a possibility for uh, people in, in North America, uh, people of African descent in North America, a place where they could possibly go and start a new life, because clearly uh, the attitudes among whites uh, in early America was not hospitable to blacks becoming re recognized as full citizens. So he was very interested in, in, in the United States creating, the, creating their own version of, of a Sierra Leone. So um, thanks to the support of Paul Cuffey and others, uh, the American colonization uh, was established in, in, in 1816. Uh, interesting, many members of this colonization society were uh, Vir Virginians and uh, people from Maryland, parts of the Upper South where, where slavery was not as prominent as it once had been, not as profitable. Uh, as I mentioned before, people like George Mason and Thomas Jefferson uh, wanted a way to, uh, to abolish slavery without having to extend citizenship uh, and equal rights uh, to, to freed people. And so colonization, um, to them was a, was a way of, of dealing with the problem of slavery uh, in, a, in a very neat way. And so the American Colonization Society uh, began raising money uh, with the hopes of, of, of resettling uh, former slaves uh, to, uh, freed slaves to, uh, to Africa. 
Uh, they didn't have a colony yet, they, but they wanted to create something like uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, in 1819, sort of an, an auxiliary of the American Colonization Society was created uh, and would eventually receive congressional funding uh, to, to help uh, resettle people who were freed uh, from the international slave trade. This is known as the United States Agency for Recaptured Africans. Uh, in the 1820s, uh, the United States created Liberia, uh, just south of, of Sierra Leone, and Liberia became the colony where um, uh, American uh, slaveholders could uh, send uh, their slaves if they wanted uh, to uh, manumit them and manumit them outside the borders of the United States. Uh, and it was also a place where people who were freed from the international slave trade, people whose uh, slave ships were intercepted by naval patrols, uh, could be resettled. Uh, and from the 1820s really to the 1850s, um, settlement really uh, begins and uh, continues. And some of the people who were settled there uh, become known, uh, and I'll show you some maps of Liberia. You can see Sierra Leone uh, is, is here, just south uh, of Sierra Leone. Uh, the capital of Liberia uh, was Monrovia, named for James Monroe who signed the, the charter uh, for this uh, colony. And uh, Liberia soon became a population of, of Americo Liberians, people who, uh, whose masters uh, agreed to pay for their passage um, back. Some people were able to raise their own funds to go to Liberia. There were um, uh, free blacks in the United States who, uh, like James Cuffey, held out hope that this could be a, a, a promising uh, uh, independent black nation. Uh, the Americo Liberians were people of African descent who had been born in, in North America and were now living uh, in Liberia. Um, they would uh, interact with uh, the, uh, the recaptives, or sometimes called uh, the Congos. Uh, by this point, a lot of the slave trade was centered on uh, the Congo Delta. Um, as, uh, as patrols of the African coast uh, became more intense, the British Navy began patrolling. Later, the U.S. Navy began patrolling, trying to intercept international slave traders. Um, the uh, slave trade went further and further south in the continent, some t in some cases went around uh, to the Indian Ocean side, to Mozambique. Uh, and uh, so sometimes uh, the enslaved people who were uh, liberated uh, from these naval uh, interceptions uh, were, were referred to as Congos, and many of them were not actually from, uh, actually from the Congo. Um, but there in Liberia, the recaptives or Congos, in some cases, intermarried with uh, the Americo uh, Liberians and became kind of a dominant uh, ruling class of that, um, that colony. And by uh, the 1840s, the United States had, had stepped back uh, and uh, the colony was more or less autonomous and soon uh, independent. There was a lot of criticism, of course, of Liberia among uh, African Americans. Um, Martin Delaney, uh, pictured here, uh, uh, was a prominent uh, reformer. Uh, he uh, was a physician uh, by trade, uh, but was uh, someone who observed that uh, the racism in American society in, in the mid-19th uh, century was still so prevalent that it still inculcated uh, an, an attitude of inferiority among people of African descent, that, that people of African descent were better off leaving uh, the uh, United States. Uh, he didn't like the idea of, of Liberia necessarily. He was more interested in, in leaving the United States and maybe setting up a colony uh, near uh, his uh, ancestral homeland in Nigeria. Um, but generally speaking, uh, he was opposed to the idea of, of, of colonization. Um, but at the same time, he didn't really see that the United States in his lifetime would ever get over many of these uh, racist tendencies. Over time, uh, the uh, United States Navy um, got more and more active in patrolling uh, the Atlantic, uh, establishing an Africa squadron uh, that patrolled up and down uh, the west coast of Africa. Of course, there's uh, a lot of miles uh, to, uh, to cover, many hundreds of miles of coastline. Uh, and uh, many uh, 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 slaves uh, and slave vessels uh, were able to slip through the naval patrols. Uh, another problem that uh, the, uh, the, the, the war on the slave trade uh, faced was that the, the different nations involved, particularly uh, Great Britain and the United States, 
who had the most sort of invested in the naval patrols in the Atlantic, uh, didn't cooperate with each other very well. Uh, the United States uh, was um, uh, very sensitive about allowing British vessels to stop their um, uh, merchant vessels and uh, search and, and seize them. This had been an impetus for a war uh, back in 1812. And so throughout the 19th century, uh, the United States would not allow uh, the British uh, Navy to stop suspected slave traders who were flying the American flag. Uh, and because of this, uh, many um, uh, non-American uh, slave uh, ventures, such as Spanish slave traders, French, uh, Dutch slave traders would fly the American flag and take on what was called a flag captain, a single American who would uh, serve as the official captain saying that this was an American vessel and so that the British uh, Navy couldn't uh, stop them without perhaps causing uh, international uh, disturbance in international relations between the United States uh, and Great Britain. And so uh, a lot of people still were, were taken into slavery, uh, were captured and taken into slavery uh, throughout the 19th century. I do, though, want to end on a more uh, positive note. A lot of this has been uh, very, uh, uh, very disturbing, but I think it's important uh, to, to understand uh, American history, warts and on, and many uh, don't agree with me uh, on that. Um, but ultimately, we started talking about, uh, and the focus of this talk was about the Constitution. And I want to end with three amendments to the Constitution um, that come back to these issues of uh, the power of the federal government versus states' rights. Uh, and uh, the uh, em emphasis on commercial interests, uh, or weighing the uh, commercial interests and economic interests of Americans versus uh, sort of universal ideals of, of human rights. Um, by the 1860s, uh, there was a move toward more uh, international cooperation. Um, but frustrating uh, to, to many abolitionists in the United States, is that uh, even though uh, a number of, of slave traders were clearly caught uh, red-handed uh, in the act of, uh, of being involved in, in the Atlantic slave trade, maybe not red-handed, but at least a lot of strong evidence of their involvement uh, in uh, the slave trade, um, slave trader after slave trader was uh, acquitted. And there were n literally no convictions. Um, uh, up, and, up through the 1850s, from 1808, from that non-importation law went into effect, uh, up into the Civil War, we'll see in 1862, uh, all slave traders <coughs> get away with it. And th there was never any official punitive measures taken uh, toward people involved uh, in, in the slave trade. Things would begin to change, though, uh, in the Lincoln administration. Of course, a lot of this had to do with uh, the Civil War. Uh, that began in 1861. Uh, and uh, the concentration of slavery at that point was now decidedly uh, in, uh, in the South. Uh, and with that region uh, f f seceding and forming a, a confederation, uh, declaring their independence from the United States, uh, the Lincoln administration uh, began to become much more aggressive and proactive in clamping down on the slave trade, which he believed would help uh, perpetuate uh, the Confederate States of America. So Lincoln uh, actually uh, agrees to allow British vessels to so stop, search, and seize any American vessel that they believed to be suspected of being involved in the slave trade. A lot of this was a wartime measure meant to, to cripple the Confederacy, uh, but nevertheless, it is a, a step in that uh, direction. Uh, also in 1862, a man named Nathaniel Gordon uh, he was originally from Maine, uh, but uh, was a... Uh